Okay, so I think we're back on track, hopefully. Thank you for everybody for being patient. Um, and apologies uh, for being up there. Um, it was all going so smooth. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, we're we just going to resume um, and I'm going to pass over to John. So, um, Dr. John Ingram is um, hopefully very familiar to you all. He leads the Food Systems Research at Oxford University Environmental Change Institute. Um, and he um, looked particularly at the relationship between food security and environmental change. Um, he trained originally in soil science and uh, worked for NERC, the National Environment Research Council on Global Change and Agroecology, and he's worked on agriculture and forestry research in Africa and Asia. Um, and he is, of course, the program director of ISFEL. So I'm going to hand over to John now. Good. Thanks uh, very much, Lauren. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 10 or 15 minutes is just share some of, some of my thinking and that uh, several colleagues, particularly my close colleague, Ariella Hopkoff, on what we mean by food system resilience and the way that it helps us um, develop a more robust food systems. So let's have a look here. The first thing is the question, what do we want from food systems? Um, obviously, food security outcomes are, are paramount, um, often thought of in terms of these three major components, food utilization, access, and availability, all of which need to be stable over time. But of course, food systems and the various activities within food systems give rise to a whole host of other societal interests, such as those listed on the right of the screen, employment for all the uh, people working in the food sector, health uh, comes from our consumption patterns and health and safety issues across the food sector, and ecosystem. There are a number of questions, four questions that I'm going to be looking at about resilience, two of which are, um, how shall I put it, in the common parlance. We often say resilience of what to what. But there's a, a third question for whom, and there's a fourth question over what time period. And these four um, questions is what we're going to be looking at now. So the of what, first of all, we're talking about the food system activities. We want to have resilient activities, producing, processing, packaging, etc. But we're also very interested in the resilience of these activities to deliver the outcomes that we want from the food system. The food security, but also the social outcomes and to minimize the environmental outcomes. Moving on to the to what, food um, system stresses and shocks is what we're interested in. The uh, two words, stress and shock, have different meanings. Um, what I've put here is that we're thinking about a stress in terms of uh, pressure or tension exerted on a system. And a shock is, is a much more surprising idea suddenly something happens that affects the system. And you can see in the examples here, um, as an example of stress would be a, just a, a gradual change in demography or a change in our social and cultural norms, change in climate, whereas a shock would be an extreme weather event or a food scare or a trade embargo. And across the whole piece, of course, we have geopolitics, um, the emergence of science and technology, and a host of other ideas you could probably think of. So, to what? Food system stresses and shocks. And then if we move to the third question, for whom? Who are we interested in? Well, we've got the food system actors, of course, the, the farmers, the fishermen, the retailers, and ourselves as consumers. But we need to re recognize that um, all of these actors, ourselves included, are influenced by a wide range of drivers, whether they're policy drivers or economic, social, environmental drivers and the like. The other point is that all of these actors have a, have a range of motives. Um, for many, it's to have a job or a livelihood strategy. For others, it's to have a healthy diet like ourselves. So, um, and for others, again, it's to, it's to raise, raise a profit. So the actors, um, the for whom, includes a whole range of people who are influenced by a range of drivers. And then we can say, over what time period? Well, um, talking to colleagues in the food sector, they are keen to separate the notion of a short-term interruption, which is usually due to a shock, 
such as an extreme weather event interrupting an agricultural activity or fishing. The um, examples I've put here is that maybe in a food processing sector there's a critical ingredient that um, stops uh, is no longer available for some reason, or the just-in-time groceries delivery that many of our advanced supermarkets are working with may be interrupted through a bit of bad weather or whatever. And of course, our own shopping patterns due to food scare. These are these are shops. They're short-term interruptions by and large. But over the longer term is what the industry refers to as disruptions, which is usually due to stresses as opposed to shocks. For instance, slow but um, insidious degradation of natural resource, or a slow creeping up of energy price, or a change in dietary preference over time. So this is two time periods to think about. In order to think about the, 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 the resilience, we can think of three different notions. First of all, the robustness, which is a, a very commonly understood uh, understanding of notion of resilience, the ability to resist a disruption to a current outcome. There's a strength notion, there's a sort of build a wall idea, and it stops the stress or the shock affecting what we want. That's the robustness argument. Another commonly held um, notion is that of recovery after an event. That the aim in there is to return to what we wanted, uh, the current outcome, after the disruption. So to get back to where we were, that again is a very commonly held understanding of resilience. But perhaps um, the third one is, is new to some of us, the notion of reorientation or transformation, where we're actually um, going to accept an alternative outcome after disruption. We don't want to go back to how it was. We're happy to have a new future, if you will. And this is, um, this is an interesting area for food systems because it's very much to do with the social acceptance. So this is why food systems are a good example of a, of a socio-ecological socio system because it's got that element of choice in it, which is a human, a human attribute. Now, whichever of these three notions we're working with, we recognize that they will all involve some sort of reorganization of the system. You can build a bigger wall to make it more robust. You can put in place mechanisms to allow rapid recovery. Or you can reorganize the system so that we're happy to accept an alternative outcome. It's this reorganization which is the important point, often known as adaptation, and this is really where we'll be talking about options to change things in the system. So what can we change? Well, the first notion of, of enhancing resilience is that we can adapt the food system activities. These words on the screen um, are all what we do, they're doing words, they all end in the letters ing, which is a little reminder that they're things we do. And we can do these differently. We can farm differently, we can process differently, and of course we can consume differently. So that's one way to adapt the activities. However, we can also adapt the drivers. And so this means looking at the demography or the social political context. And on the right side of the slide, we see a number of, of examples of um, areas of adaptation that are possible in social or science and technology or environmental. For instance, in social, we can adapt the way uh, our education system works. We can adapt our healthcare systems. Moving down in policy, particularly um, topical at the moment here in the UK, uh, discussion about our agri-environment schemes, the discussion about our nutrition policy. We see the, uh, the advent of the sugar tax again in our, in our press this week we can change our health and safety uh, policies. And of course, when it comes to markets, um, we can look at market structure, we can have new uh, competition rules, we can have new trade rules, again, very topical stuff at the moment here in the UK. So in essence, we can, we can adapt the activities and we can adapt the drivers. These are the sort of major areas of intervention, and I'm sure you can think of many examples in your own work where these, these um, three com uh, concepts, notions of, of resilience, 
attain. One of the um, one of the, the key points to re re remember, of course, is that one doesn't have to only use one of those notions. Often, in practice, um, elements of all three are being considered in, a, in an organisation, and dependent on the circumstances and the nature of the driver, the different degree of of, of use, if you will, of, of robustness or recovery or reorientation may be the correct and the best way forward. So I'll close just with a, a, a bit of information that here in the UK we have a, a major uh, research program underway, a part of the Global Food Security um, Program of the UK. Um, there are 10 projects running, there's a website there and the purpose of this work is to help policy and practice optimise the resilience of the UK's food system to a range of shocks. So do have a look at that website if you wish. So that's um, something of an overview of the concepts that I'm working with about resilience, the four questions of what, to what, for whom and over what time period, and the three notions of resilience, the robustness, the, um, the, the, the recovery and the reorientation are all very much on the table for discussion. So I'll close there now if I may. Great, thank you very much John. Um, that was a really great overview um, and I think we're now going to be looking at some of this more in detail and practice with Rosemary. So Dr Rosemary Collier is the Director of the Warwick Crop Centre um, and she is of course the Warwick Lead Academic for Estelle Bear. Um, she trains as an entomologist and she specialises in pest, insects and horticultural crops. Um, she's collab collaborated with colleagues across a wide range of disciplines from sociology and statistics to engineering and data studies to address the wider aspects of food systems. And she leads the master's programmes in work on sustainable crop production and food security. So I'll hand over to you, Rosemary. Okay, right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for sticking with it. Um, so, whilst I guess John has been talking about um, resilience in a, in a sort of global context, um, I wanted to hone down a bit on resilience in crop production systems. So basically I'm talking about biological um, systems. So in living systems, resilience is the capacity of an ecosystem um, to actually respond to a, a disturbance or perturbation um, by resisting damage and then recovering quickly. Um, and John's already been talking about some of these, but in crop production systems, so which are essentially ecosystems, sometimes quite simple ecosystems, um, then the sorts of per perturbations that might be encountered include extreme events, um, outbreaks of pests and diseases, um, and pollution events from pesticides or, or fertilisers. Um, so what I want to do for the next few minutes is just look at several aspects of resilience in, in crop production systems. Um, and then finish by sort of moving a bit up the, up the chain um, and looking at resilience in terms of, of producers, so growers and farmers, um, and then the, the retailers, the, the supermarkets, wholesale markets um, that they, they serve, and obviously your customers of those retailers. So the first thing to I think to think about is um, I'm going to focus on crop production. The principles I think apply to livestock production as well. Um, but I guess one of the basics is actually the genetics uh, of the crop that you're going to grow um, and how well um, the crop can cope with the various stresses such as drought or pests or diseases or, or weeds. Um, and the problem is with um, modern crops, most modern crops, is that although they were the, they were derived from wild species, selected from wild species, um, a lot of their um, resilient attributes have been lost over time through selective breeding. Um, and that's because at least probably for the last hundred years um, we've been breeding for mainly high input protected systems where um, we have fertilizers, pesticides, and irrigation, so we don't really need, or we haven't needed, those, those resilient features. Um, so, apart from being probably less resilient uh, in terms of these various events, 
Um, modern varieties are genetically uniform um, and their characteristics are consistent from batch to batch. So when you buy um, a pack of seeds, a particular variety, you'll get the same product from one year to the next. Um, this is very efficient to manage, um, to harvest and market on a large scale. And obviously a lot of a lot of production around the world is now done at a large scale. However, in the past, farmers selected and maintained their own seed, um, and, and these, these sort of um, collections of seeds are often called land races. Um, they're genetically more, more variable, and this variability means that they, they also are able to evolve over time. So each year, the farmer will be making a new, a new selection, um, and they become adapted to local conditions. Um, and I recently heard about one really nice example of a land race, um, which is still grown in the UK in, in Orkney. Um, and this is uh, a barley called beer barley. Um, and it's genetically very variable. It's very well adapted to growing in the conditions in, in northern Scotland. Um, it's sown in the spring, harvested in the summer. Um, and it has a very rapid growth rate. Um, and the reason why it survives and it, it still grown is because it's a speciality product that's used to make um, Scotch whisky. So land races are, if you like, they're, they're genetically variable, but that, that variation within a species. Um, but there are other ways of increasing um, variation in a field. Um, and one approach is, is termed polyculture which is about growing more than one species in a field. So that may be intercropping, where two crops are grown together. It may be companion planting, where two or more species are grown together, but you're probably only harvesting one. And then over under-sowing, where, um, for example, you might grow cabbages in a background of, of clover. And polyculture is, is used extensively in some parts of the world. Um, now generally in more in developing countries than um, in industrial agriculture um, and that's because it maximizes the use of land so you get increased yield per hectare um, and it also spreads the risk so if one crop fails you've probably still got the other one and then uh, various um, research studies have shown that there are all sorts of other possible advantages in terms of using water more efficiently nutrients suppressing weeds um, suppressing pests. So a whole range of potential advantages. And sort of moving on from, if you like, growing um, herbaceous plants together, then agroforestry is another form of, of polyculture um, that people are becoming increasingly interested in again, um, which is where you grow trees also as part of your cropping system, which way themselves provide uh, another crop um, and again, may provide a whole range of, of benefits um, to do with the, the soil, um, access to water, uh, and biodiversity. So, as I'm an entomologist, I'm interested in, in, in pests of plants, um, then I wanted to focus a little bit on resilience to attack by pests and diseases. And one approach for this is to try and find sources of host plant resistance. So, as I said earlier, often this has been bred out, um, but people are now looking um, in wild relatives and other, other sources um, for resistance that can then be bred into the, the crops that we grow commercially. Uh, and this type of resistance is genetically determined and it can either be complete, so a plant can be completely resistant, or it can be partial. Um, one of the problems with host plant resistance, particularly if it's complete, is it imposes a, a large selection pressure um, on the pest or pathogen population. Um, so often then you can get a sort of evolutionary arms race as the, the pest or pathogen population um, evolve, adapt to overcome the resistance. So you keep having to find new forms of resistance with different mechanisms um, to sort of fight, fight back. Um, and in terms of resilience, 
then you can actually be proactive about this. Uh, and if you have a range of different mechanisms of resistance, then you can actually um, either plant them, uh, the different mechanisms together in, well, in sequence, in space, uh, or in time, so that you're varying the selection pressure all the time. Another approach uh, to increasing resilience to attack by pests and pathogens is to manipulate habitats to try and enhance natural uh, predators and, and parasites of pests. Um, so one question people have been asking for quite a while is can increased plant diversity around and within crops enhance the performance of natural enemies? Um, and there's been quite a lot of work done uh, in terms of cereal crops, particularly um, with uh, planting wildflowers around margins of fields. Uh, but in my area, which is, is fresh produce, um, then there are few examples at the moment of successful uh, habitat manipulations that actually increase natural pest control. Um, I just wanted to also focus for a, a moment on the soil, and perhaps I should have started with the soil, as, as that is the, the basis for crop production. Um, and it's quite interesting um, to look at the, the various functions of, of soil. Um, so obviously, first of all, it's a medium for biomass production, so food, fibre, uh, fuel production. It's also an interface between the atmosphere and, and water resources um, because of the fact that the, the soil is able to buff, buffer and, and filter water as well. Um, it's also, uh, if you like, a biogeochemical reactor. There are lots of um, reactions and processes that go on in there um, to do with um, a lot of it to do with detoxification, um, etc. Uh, and it's also a reservoir and source of biodiversity. So, if the quality of the soil is poor, and people do have Difficulty sometimes actually defining what is good soil quality and what is bad soil quality. But if the quality is, is poor, um, then it can have very adverse effects on, on crops. Um, one of the factors that uh, helps to improve uh, soil quality is organic matter. Um, and this is a great contributor to the provision of, of resilience. Um, through a whole uh, range of, of functions, um, one of which is that it provides a food source for uh, the many organisms that live in the soil, which have all sorts of roles. So overall, good soil quality provides re resilience in the face of, of perturbations, um, such as extreme weather events, so drought or flooding, or pollution, say, from, from pesticides. So, for my last couple of slides, I, I just wanted to uh, say move up a move up a level and talk about resilience at the scale of the producer, so the farmer or grower, and then at the, the retailer. And what has happened, I guess, in countries like the UK is that many producers have now become specialists, so they only grow one type of crop, like, for example, carrots, um, and that's because they need to invest in, in specialist expertise and equipment um, and it's also about the scale at which they're supplying um, the, the, the fit market to multiple race retailers. So for individual companies, farming companies, then resilience is underpinned by their considerable expertise, um, by their choice of varieties that they grow in different places, different times, uh, by the fact that they usually have a geographical spread of, of um, farmland that they use, they plant crops sequentially. Um, they'll also often import out of season, um, and if things go wrong, uh, then they may also import as well. And then if we move up to another level, um, to the scale of the retailer, um, then at that level, um, they have more than one supplier, so that provides them with resilience, and they have more than one product. So if carrots disappear for a while, um, then they've probably got something else to sell. So in conclusion, and uh, you know, this is something to discuss, um, then I think my feeling is that, that 
resilience in, in crop production um, comes from diversity at, at all levels. Um, so at that sort of biological level, also at human levels. Um, it depends on a whole range of biological, physical and chemical processes. Um, and say for the for farmers and growers, it requires considerable knowledge and expertise. Um, so thank you for participating and thank you to all my colleagues for, for helping with this event. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, those were two really interesting talks um, and of course there's also overlaps with um, problems such as antimicrobial resistance when we're looking at the more sort of animal and human health side as well. So these concepts really spread all across different levels of food systems. Um, we've really got some questions coming in which we're going to start addressing, but I just wanted to begin um, by asking each of you if you have any comments or questions for each other. So John, I don't know if you'll start with any reflections or questions you have for Rosemary. Um, thank you. Well, uh, certainly one reflection is that the, uh, the third aspect of resilience which I was presenting, that of reorientation, um, as I said at the time, is very much an attribute of a social structure mm -hmm. where we have the choice and the ability to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily this, uh, an option for a, a natural system. Where there isn't choice in the same way at all. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your, your sort of comment on that? Do you, do you agree that you're really talking about the, the, the robustness or perhaps the, real, the, the, um, the recovery in natural systems? Um, well, I guess, yeah, in, in nat natural systems, Yes, you're right, there isn't a choice, but I guess in the reorientation to a certain extent I would see um, in the choice between um, yeah, monoculture mm -hmm. and, and polyculture. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. do actually have the choice um, to yeah, reorient, reorient our, our production system. Yeah. Um, so I guess help it to you know, help it to help itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that now, I mean, one of the constraints has been, well, the fact that we need to grow on a scale. We don't actually have the the technology to deal with more than one plant species in a field. Mm -hmm. But now, through the things that are happening at the moment, so precision farming, uh, robots, I think mm -hmm. in the future it will become a lot easier sure. to manage. Um, but um, thinking thinking forward. Um, for some of the the, the, the work you, you you're involved in, you're looking at new ways of of, of managing pests and disease through innovative um, technologies, <laughs> which is not necessarily high tech. Oh, the back. Have a tremendous um, tremendous influence. Thereby, shock isn't necessarily bad. I think mm. it's sudden. That's the point. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's been quite interesting that you both were touching on technology and, and a lot of the, the big sort of relationships between between humans inventing them and then having to adapt to them is what we were also addressing a lot in the symposium last year on, on technology mm -hmm. as well. So, um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to um, take one of the first questions we've had, which is from Alex Pinto um, from ISPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, um, and it's in particular for John, and he's asking if you could say something about and um, resilience across multiple geographical scales, e.g. from farmers to government? Um, great question, Alex. Thanks very much. Uh, think back to the for whom bit uh, are, we, are we talking about. So in, in the examples that we had from, from Rosemary, one could have the resilience of the grower uh, at the farmer level. So the resilience of what in that case? Is it the resilience of continuing to be able to supply lettuce to the market? Or is the farmer really interested in the resilience of, of, their, of their family livelihood? In which case they may no longer be interested in supplying lettuce to the market. They might want to do something else, different livelihood strategy. So then once, you know, all the way up to, 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 to government, what's the responsibility of government um, in the case of our UK uh, resilience research program, the, the question is how do we enhance the resilience of the UK food system? So the government is concerned about the, the food security of the nation. Um, this of course opens up a huge uh, tableau of, of opportunities and, and challenges. And then at a sort of intermediate level, 
think of a, of a major retailer, they they want the resilience of, of their of the business model. Um, so as Rosemary was saying, if, if there's a need to source lettuce from somewhere else, you just do it. Uh, maybe bad luck on the grower with whom you had had a contract, uh, but nonetheless, your job as a supplier of lettuce to me, the um, ultimate customer, is to make sure the shelves have still got lettuce on. So the robustness one's looking for there is the robustness of the business, the robustness to be able to satisfy my 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 expectation as a customer. So um, as one looks across these spatial levels from farm to 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 enterprise to nation, one is always having to ask the question, what is the purpose, what, what's the motivation for which resilience um, is being sought? Do you want to add anything to that, Rosemary? No, thank you. Well. Um, Alex also um, has a question for Rosemary. So you were talking about um, diversification as a strategy to increase resilience. Um, could you say something about the possible trade-offs of this? Okay. Um, so I think the, I guess the trade-offs are, at least some of them, are to do with the market. Um, and I guess it depends, yeah, which part of the world you're, you're in. And as John said, polyculture diversity is, is probably the norm in, in, in certain parts of the world. Um, but I guess in the UK, for example, then you need to actually be, yeah, to be able to supply um, a, a certain amount of, of high quality um, produce uh, and thereby that, that does force you to, to specialise just because you, you know, have a whole range of crops, you can't do it, you can't do it well. So I think it, yeah, market is, is the, main, the main factor. Um, and, um, we, were, we were sort of talking about these resilient motions at the beginning um, with John's talk, and then I was just wondering if you can say, both sort of comment a bit on how um, these, can, these resilient motions, robustness, recovery, or reorientation, how they can be applied more in practice to maintaining supply to consumers post farm gains. Mm -hmm. okay. So. Yeah, so maybe I'll focus on crop production. Sure. So, so I guess an example of, of robustness is actually um, identifying um, crop traits that that yeah provide the ability to resist. So which might be pest and disease resistant, uh, might be um, traits that increase drought drought tolerance, um, things like that. So I think that that would be that would be um, robustness. Um, in terms of recovery, um, then I guess I'm thinking about the soil um, because the, because um, as I implied, there's a whole range of organisms that live in the soil, um, and some of them have have beneficial functions. Some of them are obviously crop pathogens, um, and um, so basically, if if they, um, a, an event happens, so the soil becomes polluted um, by pesticides or becomes flooded for a long time, um, then that will will impact probably on the on the proportions of the different organisms um, that survive that that event. Um, but o over time, um, then some of those organisms will help to address the event. Event. So, for example, there are um, microorganisms that will degrade um, pesticides, so help with the, the breakdown event. Um, so, I guess again, yeah, the, the, the combination of microorganisms will actually some of them will help to restore the conditions, which then means that the other microorganisms can then um, also increase in number again. So, I think that's a you know, that's a great example of, of recovery um, to me. Um, and then so the reorientation, I think, I think was about changing your cropping, mm -hmm. your cropping system. So, so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, to me, increasing diversity is one of the routes to, to do that. There was a question I've just seen on the board, which in part um, uh, helps me frame my answer. It was. Um, um, 
Considering the interdependence and complexity of resilience aspects in the food system, it's possible to take more important and urgent actions required. So here I, I throw the question back to you, Andre. Um, who are you in the food system? Are you a primary producer? Are you a logistics and transport operator? Are you a major retailer? Or are you a consumer? And dependent on who you are, um, the answer to your question will, will change. So picking up on Rosemary's point, um, let's take the example of lettuces in the supermarket. The, the supermarket is interested in maintaining lettuce on the shelf for me to buy. Um, its approach to resilience may be to, um, to uh, be robust, that is to make sure they've got a really good supplier they can guarantee is going to deliver, or to, to reorganize, to have an operation where they can change supplier very quickly if needed, or to, or to actually think about getting a, a, you know, a different product on the market. It's not a lettuce, but it's something that I as a customer would be happy to, happy to buy. Um, and it substitutes for lettuce, and it's not going to affect my footfall in their shop. Whereas if you're the, the logistics guy, the, the, the trucking company, that is responsible for getting the lettuces from the farm to the shop, you may want to have a much more of a robustness angle so that you, you, you really are, um, you're not going to be affected by a bit of bad weather. So you buy a bigger and a stronger truck or, or whatever it is. So you, you, you see the point, depending on where you are in the system and what your activity is, how it relates to other people's activities is, is something of a moot point because you're trying to maintain and enhance the resilience of your activity. That may be contrary and indeed create a problem for somebody else. For instance, having bigger trucks may mean that something you know, to do with other aspects of transport is, is compromised. So um, it's a great question. Um, considering the interdependence and complexity, well, you've, you've said it, um, but the point is, by thinking carefully about who are we, who, you know, which actor we're talking about, which aspect of, you know, which notion of resilience are we working with, um, we can begin to find a, a way forward and an answer to the specific. I hope that's, that sort of answers your question, Andre, and also touches on Alex's point. Yeah, and I think also relates to a lot of what we try and do in this about understanding, you know, world views and trying to map out all these different um, positions that people are coming from and, and, mm -hmm. and different drivers on them. Um, so we also have, we've, we've got about five minutes left. I think we will run over a bit for anyone who can stay because obviously we did have um, about 10 minutes of interruption. Um, so I've got a question here from Helen um, Greenwood um, from uh, SCRN. So, um, uh, uh, to either of you, or you may go for comment. So, uh, modern technology often depends on highly specialised global supply chains. Um, for example, few people would be able to build a computer from scratch um, on their own. Do you think making the food system more resilient might depend on making the broader system of technology more resilient? Interesting. Technology is coming quite a long way. Wow, that's a great yeah. question. I mean, I, I would just think about the, I guess, the, mo the mobile phone, in that the, the most, so, so I guess, the, again, in, in places like the UK, we had, um, you know, we, we've had an evolution of the telephone, haven't we? Um, we've had, had you know, mm. I can't think of the right word for it now, but house phones, and now we've gone on to mobile phones. Um, whereas, I guess, in the developing world, then kind of they, they missed a step and, and now, you know, mobile phone, phones are very available. And actually, I think mobile phones um, are, in, in those parts of the world, um, a key factor in, in, in food production, basically, in, in yeah, keeping in, in contact with the, you know, the key supplier, the whatever, um, and with the, the market as well. So, so although, yeah, I guess people don't build their own mobile phones, um, it's a relatively cheap form of technology that actually made a, you know, made a big difference. Mm -hmm. I, I like the, the, the notion in the question about the, the broader system of technology. How do we make that more resistant, uh, or more resilient? Um, if one was to think of the just-in-chain supply method, that, in, that uses a whole host of different technologies all at once. Um, 
very dependent on communications. So yes, anything that anything that, that challenges any aspect of that complex mix of technologies is um, is, is is of concern to people who depend on just in, uh, you know, just in time delivery. Of course, with the advent of, of blockchain, there is now an increased awareness and transparency and accountability of what's going on in, in our very globalized supply chain. And the, certainly the retailers and the major um, food companies are, are taking the blockchain advent very seriously and using it as effectively and efficiently as they can, in part to help uh, harmonize all these other technologies. So we've, we've had a new technology arrive on the block, blockchain, excuse the pun, which is all of a sudden helping to organize all the other technologies and to monitor and, and add value and add efficiency to the system. So it seems to be an ever increasing mix of technologies and um, that, that will be a really interesting aspect for food system thinkers, how all these new technologies are interacting with the food system through its, through its entirety and how it affects and enhances the outcomes that, that we're after. Um, I have a question here from Rosemary from Serena at Warwick. Um, do you think that microbial life of the soil is increasingly considered the answer to crop resilience and outcomes? I think the value of it is increasingly recognised, yes, yes. And, and, and I guess in some ways we have, um, say, organic um, production to thank for that, at least the initial recognition of the, or, or re-remembering of the fact that that life in the soil is important. Um, I think the other thing, and it's not my specialist area, but I think the other thing that has helped us to recognise the value is just, again, talk about technology, that actually we've now got um, techniques to be able to identify all these zillions of organisms and to understand their, their function. Yeah. So I guess, <coughs> yeah, before it was more of a black box, now we're actually beginning to understand what's going on. So that probably mm. also helps us to potentially in the future manipulate uh, conditions to you know, get things to work. Um, and this may be the last question, depending on how we do time and how we do questions. But um, so from Rebecca Wells, uh, one of our colleagues, of course, in Isabel, um, to both of you, what part do you think Isabel and our food system thinkers can play in increasing robustness and resilience? Ooh. <laughs> well, what are um, we doing about it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Um, of course, that it, in a way is the very um, reason why Ipsal was, was created and developed. Um, because as one of the earlier questioners was, was, was saying, you know, we have a, you know, a complex interacting system here. Um, taking a systems approach to it has, has, uh, is certainly going to be a, a way forward. Um, our hope um, in enhancing the, the, the capability to understand and, and, and manage the system will in itself be a step towards increasing resilience because one will know whether and when to use either the robustness or the the the, 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 um, the, the recovery or the, the reorientation aspect certainly um, the debate about diets uh, which is very much in the fore at the moment is pointing more and more towards a, a, um, a reorientation of what we as society are after. But one has to take a systems of view to that to see who will be the winners and losers um, across the whole chain um, as a major change in diet um, were that to come about. Obviously, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. So um, if one's looking to enhance the resilience, Enhancing understanding is certainly a key one, and that I think was one of the points you made, Rosemary, right at the beginning, um, so that we are more aware of where intervention can be made and how, how it can best be made and who's empowered to make that intervention. So food system thinking is, is fundamental to enhancing food system resilience. And I'll just say quickly, communication, communication, communication. <laughs> <laughs>
So between individuals, between organisations, between disciplines, and I think that's a, a very important role that if staff have to play in terms of the workforce in the in the future. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think that's a very good mm -hmm. question and the cover and you know responses to finish on there. So um, we're going to finish there and can we just apologise once again for the technical yeah. issues and thank you for sticking with us. Indeed, and thank you. we have uh, recorded this so and we will be posting it on portal but hopefully um, we can still catch everything there. So thank you very much to Rosemary and John you, and Oxford here for hosting us and Sky and Kelly who's been thank in the background resolving all of the problems that we've had. So thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.